honorable members, at the break, we were debating, and I presume that we are now ready, as many. The chair recognized the honorable member for South and Central Andros. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Good afternoon. I stand always proud to represent the great people of Mangrove Key, Central, and South Andros. First of all, I wish to extend congratulations to our country for achieving 49 years of self-government. We are now on the road to 50, and I must say, all of our citizens and residents must be commended for allowing us to achieve this milestone without any national or military coup, no disruption to our judicial system, and no civil wars. Although seemingly minuscule, these are accomplishments worthy of acknowledgement. I must also congratulate the team who executed a unique and unforgettable weekend experience, both in Nassau and on some of our family islands. The team, which comprised of musicians, production specialists, actors, singers, dancers, ushers, security, and many more I have not named, who were led by our ambassador and my colleague to CARICOM, Her Excellency Leslie Millibrice. Leslie Millibrice. <laughs> While we are celebrating our independence, I also wish to congratulate persons being awarded with national honors. I would like to especially congratulate our heroes from the Big Yard, who will receive their awards this National Heroes Day in October. Madam Speaker, I speak of none other than Bishop Ellis Farrington, Mr. Samuel Mackey, Mr. Henry Bean, Pastor Jeremiah Duncombe, Mrs. Francina Neely, Mr. Lofton Neely, Mrs. Mabel Stubbs, Nurse Valdemay Ramming, Reverend Dr. Alonzo Hinzi, and Roberta Edgecombe. These persons have left an indelible mark in their community, and now the country will know their names. Madam Speaker, today's bill sets out the government's structure for the regulations of our carbon credits market. As you are aware, Madam Speaker, our country is especially vulnerable to the adverse effects of climate change. These effects are as a result of increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, as pointed out by the member for St. Anne's. This bill explains how we will formulate carbon credits to act as a permission slip. When a company purchases a carbon credit, it is an approval of sorts to emit one ton of carbon dioxide into the environment. Organizations and businesses can purchase these credits through the government's regulatory body the Securities Commission, and these purchases are based on the estimates provided on how many metric tons of carbon dioxide will be allowed in the atmosphere. Madam Speaker, we will provide a target for how many tons of carbon dioxide we want to emit and structure the carbon credits in that way. What this bill means is that companies cannot use these credits as an excuse or way out of polluting the environment. The ultimate goal is to lower the amount of carbon dioxide in the earth, which means that over time, the number of available carbon credits may be decreased based on the target set. And hopefully, one day in the future, we will keep the levels of carbon dioxide so low that we can see the healing of the earth taking place. Madam Speaker, we must acknowledge that from the outset, not all companies will be ready to initiate their plans for the reduction of carbon emissions. Similarly, not all companies will benefit right away from the incentives from the utilization of carbon credits. These businesses will have to purchase carbon credits to offset their emissions because they have no other choice. 
Madam Speaker and members of this honorable house, we, mu we must acknowledge that as a new bill, it is important that the public is aware of the effects, the implications, the benefits, and risks of introducing something new. It should be commended that the Office of the Prime Minister recently held a Facebook Live event where the public was educated on the new bills regarding climate change, adaptation, and the carbon credits market. Additionally, the Securities Exchange Commission, who has responsibility for administration, released a public consultation on this bill over a week ago. Activities like these are to be commended for spurring the public's interest in civil society about the way our country is moving forward and the work this government is doing to share the information for public consumption. This is a prime example of how this New Day government aims to be open and communicate to the public about new bills and laws that will affect us all. Madam Speaker, to allow for the trading of carbon offsets, carbon removal technologies are a necessity. Such technologies include nature-based solutions that manage ecosystems like forests, mangroves, kelp beds, and soils that naturally sequester or capture carbon dioxide. Mechanical removal of CO2 from air or the ocean with direct capture technologies that use machines to extract CO2 to create other carbon-based materials, including plastics, carbon embedded cements, and rocks buried deep underground. Projects using these technologies to remove or reduce a carbon footprint can be verified for carbon offsets credits. Additionally, Companies and individuals can purchase verified carbon credits to reduce their overall emissions count. On a larger scale, investors can invest in these type of environmental projects or technologies to help provide climate change solutions and their long-term return potential. In this way, Madam Speaker, we have an established, well-laid-out structure for how the carbon market will operate in this country. Madam Speaker, I must mention the success of the Youth Climate Conference held a few days ago at the Performing Arts Center at the University of the Bahamas. Certainly, we are preparing the next generation with the knowledge and support for bringing resilient infrastructure and capacity building in the field of sustainable development and climate change mitigation. Yes. And with them providing a list of demands to the member of Cat Island, Rumkey, and San Salvador, I know they are well on their way. Yes. 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 Madam Speaker, all marketplaces require a hub for buyers and sellers to hold and exchange assets. A carbon market is no different. And the National Emissions Registry is an important element of that marketplace. The registry will allow for the accurate accounting for carbon emissions, reflecting real world greenhouse gas emissions and removals from the atmosphere. This body will be, laid, will be led by the registrar who will have the powers and functions as set out in the bill. In doing so, Madam Speaker, this New Day government will have an accurate and transparent real-world picture of our carbon emissions and carbon capture. When an organization purchases any amount of carbon credits, they are also paying a fee. Some would call it a tax. But this fee is to be used to further strengthen our infrastructure against the effects of climate change. Examples of these are the building of higher seawalls, the use of energy efficient roofing materials, or the implementation of solar panels at reduced rates. These are just some examples of how we can use the fee from the purchases to help our country fortify our buildings and land use, Madam Speaker. 
With the passing of this bill, the monies generated from the carbon market will serve as resources to fortify our seawalls, our seabeds, our mangrove forests, and our land resources. This frees up the rest of the government's funds in the Consolidated Fund to provide more resources for social empowerment, for national security, and for education. Madam Speaker, I'm hoping that some of the monies generated will also be placed into the Family Island Infrastructure Fund, which is necessary to help our islands, such as Andrus, that did not have the capacity to generate enough resources on their own to help in securing their infrastructure. My mind goes immediately to the people in Ragged Island who suffered devastating effects from Hurricane Irma. Through this bill, we can use the monies to aid in their rebuilding to ensure stronger and more resilient protection against major catastrophic storms and surges. So, as we invest further into climate financing, the introduction of carbon credits, we know that all the necessary steps must be taken to mitigate the devastation. I am happy to report that in Andrus, Approval has been given for the construction of a seawall in Burnt Rock for over 300 feet, as stated by the member for Fort Charlotte. The Ministry of Works have already begun the footwork, and as indicated, the work is scheduled for 2023. Mm -hmm. This will at least prevent the surge associated with terrible storms and help the residents who live and work on the coastline over in Burnt Rock. I hope to be able to return to this house one day soon, very, very soon, and say that more seawalls will be built in and around Andrus. Madam Speaker, we know that in many cases, people only respect what they value and what is value. If there is no price tag, no such value would be placed on a thing. For decades, we have allowed guests and visitors to our shores to enjoy the natural resources of our islands. These same islands are at risk for disruptions to our ecosystem and our landscape. Therefore, this bill is important for our country to sustain our natural landscape and our environment by setting up a value system. This will show the world that through climate finance, we are saying that the approval for company A to release carbon emissions will come with a price. Madam Speaker, to reach a net zero world, emissions need to decline. We cannot take for granted that we will always have what we have. This government has set out a strategic and efficiently planned approach to how the carbon credit market will operate and be sustained. This New Day government is serious about this effort and we are leaders in the region for providing a structure for climate financing. Yeah. It is time for the Bahamian public to become encouraged and excited, like the member for Central and South Abaco said, about a new economic category, a category that allows resources to be allocated to farmers to invest in generating biofuel for manure, one which gives support for families to undertake backyard farming and organizations to execute extensive tree planting exercises. Madam Speaker, the people of Mangrove Key, Central, and South Andrus fully support this bill and look forward to the day when we can reap the benefits from the carbon market in upgrading their communities and their quality of life. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Honourable Member. As many. The Chair recognizes the Honourable Member for Central Grand Bahama. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. West Grand Bahama, I didn't, I didn't hear that. Well, famous, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> well, famous is the way to go. Yes, yes. Madam Speaker, colleagues, 
and Bahamians around this beautiful archipelago. Pleasant good afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. I, I stand once again in this honorable chamber on behalf of the good people of Central Grand Bahama and yes, the official opposition. Central Grand Bahama, the host of the world famous Farmers Market Festival. Yes. Yes. Today, we debate another integral piece of legislation aimed at catapulting the Bahamas towards national development and economic growth. The Carbon Credit Trading Bill 2022 seeks to introduce the regulation of the trading of carbon credit and enables the Securities Commission with oversight and administration of this new industry. Madam Speaker, this initiative is definitely something myself and my opposition colleagues would like nothing more than to support to the fullest, as we have indicated um, earlier today. But like all things that we do on behalf of the Bahamian people, it must be done right. We must ensure the policies, protocols, and international best practices are meticulously laid out to ensure nothing but success in this venture. We must also utilize the knowledge and experience already in place in the form of the leading carbon credit jurisdiction. Our pristine waters, pure air, and plush forest, forestry provides us with one of the highest level of carbon credits in the entire world. We are in a position to lead the world in this effort to reduce global carbon footprint. Madam Speaker, what the Bahamas currently possess is a way to not only help ourselves, but also an avenue of refuge from major global offenders. Madam Speaker, in many ways, we are a very blessed country and people. Despite facing a lengthy hurricane season, rising sea levels, and unpredictability due to climate change, we still remain resilient. You know, one of the things that I remember growing up, and it's so amazing how much has shifted in, in 50 years, um, we were told that the island was rising. Creeks that we used to go through over, over a period of time, the water became lower because the corals were growing. And nowadays, we are being threatened with sea rise. It's going in the opposite direction due to climate change. And that's a very serious matter that we must pay critical attention to. We do not know what the future will bring as the world shifts its focus on fighting climate change and the disastrous fate that comes with its impact. Global carbon emissions continues to reach all-time highs, and scientists have suggested that global, global surface temperatures are likely to increase the intensity of hurricanes, and that is very scary. I do not know about you, but after Hurricane Dorian, I can't imagine how much more intense hurricanes or storms can be. How much worse than Hurricane Hell can we get? That Category 5 storm decimated Grand Bahama and Abaco and claimed the lives of many. They are still trying to put their pieces, pieces of their lives back together. We all also secretly fear that if an intense storm like Dorian were to hit the capital, hit New Providence, that would be a calamity for the entire Bahamas. We cannot afford to go through that again. Small island development states are continually feeling the brunt of climate change along, although we are not the greatest offenders. And, and the member from, from Fort Charlotte today stated that we are no longer a small country, we are indeed a large country. And I remember the former minister, the now leader, referred to the Bahamas not as a small island development state, but as a big ocean state. And we are indeed a, a large country to be reckoned with. We know that if we don't do anything about it, countries like the Bahamas face existential threat. Climate change refugees will become our fate if we do not address this now. The way of the world must move to combating climate change and the natural threats that comes with it. 
Yes, it is time as a country, as a country move to not only we move not, to not only save our future existence, but ensure that our global countries are also doing their parts in the fight against climate change. The implementation of the carbon credit trading bill will begin this process for us. The level of innovation will allow the Bahamas to guide the way in the climate fight and push the country that much closer towards economic development, and that is for all of us. But we cannot go to the global stage with, such, with just a great idea. We must be prepared and we must set the standard. And yes, you, yes West Grand Bahama, we must go with a plan. The regulatory framework brought forward by this New Day government should include beneficial avenues for all stakeholders and must ensure there's ease of doing business. Madam Speaker, with the Securities Commission having full oversight for this program, it is our hope that the execution will indeed be flawless. But along with the body to ensure management and implementation of this new industry, there must also be the representation of experienced environmentalists who over the years have fought for the protection of our natural resources. Moving forward, we must also put more protections in place for our environment and ensure that they are fully adhered to. In November 2019, the FNM administration started this process with the passage of a compendium of en environmental legislation. Those bills included the Ministry of Environment Bill 2019, the Environmental, the Environment Planning and Protection Bill 2019, the Environment Protection Control of Plastic Pollution Bill 2019, the Bahamas National Trust Amendment Bill 2019, the Bahamas Protected Area Fund Amendment Bill 2019, and the Tariff Amendment Bill Number Two 2019. We must, however, go further with these protection. Over the years, we have done immeasurable damage, and this is a fact, to our mangrove forests in the name of tourism and development. Destruction was done under successive governments. So we must all shoulder the blame. And when we look at places like, for example, Northern Bimini, whose mangroves were bulldozed and devastated, the vibrant coral reefs was devastated where you had vibrant marine life. And I remember, I think in a news report there, the developer said those mangroves were useless. So they bulldozed them and they did a development. I wonder what persons who would have fished in those areas some 25, 30 years ago would say if they go in those areas now. You know, the story is told that, and I don't know, maybe it's just a feel good story that Dr. Martin Luther King wrote, I have a dream speech. Um, some, uh, one of those, those landmark speeches, wild bone fishing in Bimini. Yeah, it's and if, if, it wasn't, if it wasn't, I have a dream speech, if you go there today, you may say, I have a nightmare because of a lot of destruction. We do have a lot, but a lot of destruction took place over time, and we must do our best to protect it moving forward. All of us. It happens over 20 years. So if it happens over 20 years, successive government must have been responsible. And I'm, again, I'm not pointing the finger. Over 20 years, there's only one government we had that lasted 25 years. So if it's over 20 years within that span, all of us must hold resp be responsible for it. We are all responsible. These life-altering decisions not only left us vulnerable to natural disasters, but it also diminished what we now consider such a great natural resource. But now we must move forward with renewed thinking. You know, I just got a call from a friend in Long Island. Um, Dennis Smith, they have to have some illegal dredging going on down in, in, in Huntington Estate that will stop the day along the shoreline. We need our, our environment inspectors to be out there, guarding our shorelines, ensuring that these illegal activities doesn't take place to our detriment. The decision we now make must be in line with this trajectory of environmental protection. We must begin to think outside the box now as we prepare for future generations to survive on these islands. There are a myriad of ways that the Bahamas can move towards maximizing its carbon credit. For example, 
as was indicated earlier, every tree is a reservoir of carbon. So I believe more protection of the remaining trees in this nation must be implemented. And even more so, more trees must be planted to create a greater abundance. Also, areas such as Grand Bahama and Abaco, where acres of trees have been destroyed by salt invasion, should see new trees being planted that are highly salt tolerant, such as coconut trees. These areas are ripe to accommodate these plants and develop a new industry for this country. So we can stop this importation of, of coconut water, yes. I remember Dr. Earl DeVoe sometimes took thousands of coconut trees to Andres, and I don't, I'm not sure if persons bought into it and did the planting. So, the tree's still there, good. In this way, we can see carbon deposits increasing exponentially, and the Bahamas benefiting across the board from its natural resources with additional agricultural development. And yes, the northern shoreline of Grand Bahama, parts of Abaco, the mangrove swash now was destroyed. A lot of it was destroyed. Now is the time. And I got a call from Mr. Joe Davil this morning of Water Keepers. He's down in Exuma, where the proper gules are now ripe. You know the proper gules, the, the little thing that look like a pen on the mangroves? They're ripe for planting. So it's now time to hit Dover Sound. Go to East Grand Bahama, go to the north side of, of Grand Bahama, throw the Abaco and plant these proper gules. Let us, let us replenish our marshlands. And in this light, if we are going to deal with the environment, this now means like uh, Freetown said earlier, no, sorry, not Freetown, um, Sinan said earlier, our position on oil drilling, dredging, deforestation, and even dumping from our beloved cruise industry must be cohesive with this move. And I say, as an engineer, as an architect, we should consider building more jetties, going out into the sea as opposed to digging marines inland, disturbing the seabed. More jetties, yes, go out. Create wave breakers. Build more land. We're losing land, land mass on a regular basis. The engineering is in place. You build the goings, you build your water breakers. Go out into the sea, to the deep water, as opposed to bringing the deep water into the land. When you dredge into the land, nature comes back with its fury to reclaim its own. So we should consider, in our development, building more jetties. Let's go out, create more coins. As a consideration, we know the mega cruise ships have been the biggest offenders in polluting our ocean and air with their carbon emission. Studies have shown that one, and I want to say this slowly, one cruise ship emits more carbon than 12,000 cars. One cruise ship. And during my preparation, I did some online research. And this doc document that I got that was prepared by Science Daily speaks to the fact. And I'll table this, Madam Speaker. Available research suggests that a large cruise ship can have a carbon footprint greater than 12,000 cars. And just as ahead of to us, the energy used, the energy used for staying overnight on a cruise vessel has 12 times larger the value of carbon emission than a land-based hotel. I'll say that again. The energy used overnight on one cruise ship is 12 times greater than what would be consumed at one land-based hotel. So imagine which direction we're headed in if we do not take this approach, take this matter seriously, and somehow insist on this industry being more regulated. They must be effectively, effectively regulated to minimize serious environment and health impact. The legislation put in place by the former government sought to penalize these offenders, yes, but we cannot simply cut off this industry, which is still one of the, of the biggest contributors to our tourism industry. But more can be done. And it was good to hear the Prime Minister say, stated this morning that you know, they will pay for the carbon emission. But of course, we cannot be reckless in allowing them to, because they are emitting carbon just to pay for it and all as well. You have to ensure that we do not compromise our health, health standards um, for that almighty dollar. 
The legislation put in place by the former government, like, like I said, sought to penalize these offenders. But we cannot simply cut off this industry, which is still one of the biggest contributors to our tourism industry. But more can be done, and I believe more should be done. One way, and I believe I stated this earlier, one way to further the regulation of this industry is to implement substation. And I would like for the member for Fort Charlotte and the Minister of Works to listen and the board of B BPL said it before, and I'm going to say it again. Implement substation at ports of entry, at our harbor, to provide shore to ship power. Windows, engines crank up in the harbor, all the black smoke that comes out. They're in the harbor operating during long periods of time. BPL put substations out there, regulated where they have to hook up to our substation. Make some money. And on, and on top of that, it's clean energy. Not only will this help to reduce carbon emission from these ships, but it will also create a revenue stream for Bahamas Power and Light, which is in dire need, as we all know, of additional funding and revenue. For, for years, successive government have moved to monetize our natural resources for the benefit of Bahamians. I believe that this carbon credit trading bill 2022 will be just the start for this. As you all will hear me from point out, Almost every time I come into this honored house, governments are continuous. The Minister's administration made it a priority to implement a compendium of wide-ranging protection for our environment. We knew they would create opportunities for employment, entrepreneurship, accountability, and yes, transparency. We showed the world that the Bahamas was ready, willing, and able to rise to the challenge and meet our international commitments. We were set on the preservation, we were set on the preservation of our global standing and the sustainable development of our natural resources while maintaining environmental integrity. That's important. We had, we, yes, we had the support of the opposition then because, because we all know how important it is it was for us to address these issues. We had the support of the opposition then, and you have the support of the opposition now. We all work in because we realize that we are in this thing together. This additional piece of legislation, Madam Speaker, sets to guide the critical steps in the country's move to capitalize on the global carbon credit market. We understand and acknowledge that governments are continuous, and we want them to succeed because if they win, we all win. We want to know, just want to know, that what we do is done the right way. As, all, as they succeed, then we all succeed. As always, the official opposition is here to provide bipartisan support for this new day government. And Madam Speaker, I stand in full support of this bill, but before I take my seat, I'd like to briefly address my constituents in Central Grand Bahama, to whom I am eternally grateful. Yeah, yeah. I want to advise them of some upcoming events. First of all, let me say once again how proud I am of the St. George's High School pop band. Um, I was able to sponsor a music workshop for them uh, last week, and um, it was a good, great time. And they were indeed invited to perform at the Independence Celebration at Independence Park, and they are now in high demand all over the island and they have been given an invitation now to go to the States to perform. So under the tutelage of Mr. Keita Stubbs and with the support of the principal, Principal White, they've been doing a phenomenal job. And I just want to congratulate those young individuals and encourage them to continue um, doing the great works that they are doing. Yes, there is a town hall meeting in partnership with the Pinders Point Township on July 20th at 7 p.m at the YMTA in Hunters, and of course we all know the YMTA was the location of the Bahamas' first smart park. Um, we're calling all residents of Williamstown, Mactown, Hunters, Lewis Yard, and Pinders Point. Speakers, of course, will include yours truly, Mr. Marvin, thank you. You know, a, a, lot of, a lot of lives were lost as a result of persons not being able to swim. Um, and I, I've had family members who advised me, had they not been at a certain height, they would not have survived Dorian. 
a lot, and unfortunately, in this, this nation, most of our people, a lot of our people cannot swim, save their life. And as a part of this township, we're inviting Marvin Johnson, who is always an EMS specialist, to come out and, and speak on the importance of, of swimming and, and also implement programs to teach swimming in Central Grand Bahama. And of course, we'll invite um, the other constituents to join us. Ms. Tommy Mitchell will be speaking on disaster preparedness. Uh, ASP Sears will be speaking on neighborhood watch. And this is very important. Dr. Lakeisha Johnson will be speaking on mental health. So this is July 20th at 7 p.m. at the YMTA in Hunters. <coughs> on this coming Monday night, I'll be meeting with the community of Williams in Russelltown at the community center in Russelltown, where we're about to repair the roof. Um, the roof is badly damaged um, over time, and the roof is caving as well as the ceiling itself. And uh, the member of parliament, who happens to be me, purchased plywood, um, fell paper, and a sheet rock or gypsum board for the repairs uh, to that community center. And I'll be meeting with them on Monday at the community center in Williamstown to make that donation and to map the way forward with respect to our repairs. Other town meetings and, and other zones of Central Grand Bahama will be announced at a later date. So Madam Speaker, I'm continually honored and grateful to this, for this opportunity to be the voice for the people of Central Grand Bahama especially in matters such as these that directly impact their future. Madam Speaker, colleagues, Central Grand Bahama is in full support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. As many, the Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Golden Isles. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Speaker. This afternoon, I rise on behalf of the residents of the great constituency of Golden Isles and again wish to extend my sincere gratitude for the trust they have bestowed on me during the recent general election some 10 months ago. Madam Speaker, as we near the first anniversary of this administration, I want to begin my presentation, if you'd permit me, with sharing with regards to, to the constituency. Thank you. The people of Golden Isles, we continue to work hand in hand to achieve the goals that we have set for the constituency. We are continuing our monthly cleanup campaign throughout the constituency, though with some challenges. And I wish to extend special thanks to those residents who volunteer. And every time we have them, they are there, especially from Adelaide, Coral Harbor, and the Dignity Gardens Associations who partner with us on occasions to ensure that the surroundings in their communities are kept clean. Our road paving, drainage, and signage programs are ongoing, not as fast or as quickly as we would like for them to, but we're thankful to the the member for Fort Charlotte and the staff at the Ministry of Works, and we know they have to divide themselves among all of us. And so, so we, 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 we're grateful for the support we're getting. I know, Madam Speaker, without a doubt, that at the end of the day, things will work together for the good and we'll become that community of choice on this island, New Providence. The great constituency of Golden Isles continue to grow from strength to strength. 
We recently, as other branches have had, our branch elections. And I would like to thank Mr. Henry Culmer, the immediate past chairman of our branch, and his executive team for the great work they did in ensuring that the party was well represented in the constituency. I would also like to take this time to welcome and congratulate the new branch chair, Ms. Deborah Bain, and her executive team. And Madam Speaker, I look forward to working closely with them to provide the kind of representation that the people of Golden Isles deserve. I continue to stress this point that Golden Isles is the largest constituency and has the most registered voters in all of the constituency. And I feel with that, some things ought not be divided equally. And, and among them are the, road pay, are the road, roadside contracts. Okay. If I have the biggest constituency by far, I should have the most roadside contracts by far. And so I'm just asking those persons responsible to bear that in mind as we move forward. I, I, I must accept what I have. I'm a team player. I'm playing with the team. But I just want the coach of the team to know. Get more. If there's, a, if there's a player on this team who is being discriminated against, not intentionally. Mm. And so when they meet at that table again, smile on you. A little, smile on me a little more. More. Having said that, now, I, no, not the bill yet, so more constituency matters. <laughs> Golden Isles is a very diverse constituency. Mm -hmm. We go from all of the, the classes, to the upper to the whatever, to the whatever. We encompass all of them. And it's against this backdrop. I want to thank all of my colleagues for the system. And I'll speak specifically to the Minister of Social Services and his Minister of State responsible for urban renewal. And we hope by the end of summer that we will have our, our center up and running. And as I mentioned the last time I spoke, is that because our constituents have to go to Oaksfield, the pit road, and it's, it's a long ways, particularly for those who do not have transportation. And so we're looking forward to that center because that's a part of what the, the, the services that the center would be providing. And so I wish to thank you, Minister, and the Minister of State in advance. It's greatly appreciated by us and the people of uh, the constituency, those who we began to share the good news with. i also like to take this opportunity to thank the good member for Anglican and the Minister of Education in advance. Um, Madam Speaker, as I, as I said, Golden Isles is the largest constituency with the most registered voters. Golden Isles have one primary school. It's in Adelaide Village. with a student population of a little over 100. So our parents, in trying to get students to go to schools as, you know, as near to the, where they live as they can. Yes. Of course, the Ministry of Education had a, has a feeder system. And that's understood. And so some go as far as H.O. Nash, some go as far as government high school. And so I am making a public plea to the, to the member for Cat Island and to Salvador Rumkins and Salvador, to the good member of Angleston, to consider, <laughs> to please consider a state-of-the-art school from preschool to primary to junior high to senior high school. All age. All age. All age. On the family islands, we call it all age. All age. Please, please, <laughs> remember that. <laughs> please, please. 
consider consider golden eyes in that regard. And, and I, so I wish to, we've had our conversations in private, so I want to thank her publicly in advance. There you go. And for, for, for what she's what, what she's going to do on, on, the, on behalf of the good people of the great constituency of Golden Isles. So, so, Madam Minister, I wish to thank you in advance. The summer break is upon us. Hundreds of students are looking for some activities or employment. No different than other constituencies. We've partnered with a number of churches in our constituency who are having summer programs to ensure that students throughout the constituency will have the opportunity to participate in activities during this time. I'd like to thank my colleagues, the members, Member of Parliament for Golden Gates, Member of Parliament for Garden Hills for their assistance in providing some employment for a number of students in our constituency. And I'm sure the financial assistance and the work experience they attained during this time would be very beneficial to them. On their behalf, I say thank you. In trying to alleviate some of the financial strain of preparing students to return to school, our constituency office will be hosting our annual back to school event on the 13th of August, 13th of next month, from three to six on Bacardi Park. And we're inviting parents, children from all over the constituency to come for an afternoon of fun, food, games, activities, and of course, we'll contribute to our share of school supplies. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, we know that many families are struggling financially and cannot afford to take vacations or even provide some social entertainment for their families. So what we've decided to do is that for the, we divide what we call the Golden Isles Family Friday Nights. Each Friday night during the month of August, we'll be on Coral Harbor Park one Friday, the park in Adelaide another Friday, Bacardi Road, and then the park Dignity Gardens. And we'll be hosting families to movie nights. And we invite all of the families in Golden Isles to come, bring your blankets, your chairs, to make yourself feel comfortable and relaxed, and enjoy a movie, a family-friendly movie. We'll provide the refreshments, the hot dogs, the popcorn, the candies, the drinks, etc. Of course, absolutely unleaded. Of course. Of course. <laughs> and, if we, and if we catch you sneaking it in, there will be consequences. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I would like to point out, as I conclude for my constituency, that there are a number of deaths in our constituency, and I'd like to convey our condolences. The families of Dr. Kirkwood Neely, Mrs. Gale, Katrina Magoulas of Coral Heights East, Ms. Cindy Camp of Adelaide, her family, Ms. Helen Rigby, Carmichael Road West, and the families, Madam Speaker, of Mr. Anthony Colby and Mr. Ashwood Roll, both of Dignity Gardens. They were the two young men who tragically lost their lives in the traffic accident on Gladstone Road last week. It is a prayer that Almighty God would comfort, strengthen, and keep those families, particularly during this difficult and challenging time. And may their souls rest in peace. Madam Speaker, before I get to the bill, I just want to speak to an issue that the member from East Grand Bahama raised this morning. Several, but I'm going to speak to one of those issues. It has to do with the alleged denial of the permit to water keepers in Grand Bahama to replant and restore mangroves. There are some issues with, with, with them. However, I've spoken to the parties involved personally, and I wish to assure the House, I wish to assure that 
They have resubmitted the application to a forestry unit, and I don't see any stop signs ahead. I see no roadblocks ahead, and I expect that to be concluded once it goes through the regular process and in a positive manner for them. And so that's, I just wanted to give that update on that. Now, Madam Speaker, to the bill at hand. The Carbon Credit Trading Bill 2022 represents a critical and another defining moment for our country, of which I'm happy to help to shape and to launch. We are taking yet another giant step in line with our global neighbors. We are a small country, but we're swinging a big bat. The United States, Canada, and the UK have implemented legislation within the last few years to regularize carbon emissions and create tools to fight against climate change. Madam Speaker, the aim is to reduce carbon emissions, that the billows of black smoke that you may see coming from factories, warehouses, large shipping vessels, airplanes, manufacturing businesses, etc. That's the result of the use of fossil fuel. Fossil fuels include coal, petroleum, heavy oils, and natural gases that significantly damage our environment. Air pollution from fossil fuels can cause acid rain, damage to crops, and to forests or pine yards, and harm to wildlife. Water pollution from oil spills to fluids and chemicals. If you look closely, we can see those emissions, some of them occurring right here in the Bahamas. Stop some time and look more closely in the air, in the sea. Look around us, and you'll see evidence of it. Madam Speaker, we have a, I call it a divine duty and mandate to protect our country. Yes. We have to preserve our country. And we are doing that through the implementation and the sustainment of a, legal, of a legal framework around carbon credit trading. Over the last two years, our weather has become almost unpredictable and unreliable. And there are many reasons and conditions that have created this unpredict unpredictability. But carbon emissions plays a significant role. This legislation ultimately creates a legal framework for the trading of carbon credits in or from within the Bahamas. One may ask, what is carbon credits? In a layman's term, a carbon credit is like a permit that represents one ton of carbon dioxide removed from the environment or from the atmosphere. The equivalent of one ton of carbon dioxide is like driving 23,000 miles in a standard car or even 25 million plastic straws placed along our beaches and parks and homes. The carbon dioxide has a significant impact on the environment. These carbon credits can be used, can be purchased, pardon me, by an individual or a company to make up for carbon dioxide emissions that come from industrial production, delivery vehicles, or travel. Ultimately, a company will need permission from the government to engage in certain activities that emit carbon dioxide. The question may be asked, why now? 
Back in the day, we used to say, if not now, then when? And my response is, shouldn't we be tired of these major hurricanes impacting our lives, our loved ones, our jobs, our homes, our country? If there's anything that we can do to help manage it, to alleviate it, to prevent it, to diminish it, we ought to do it, and it ought to be done now. It's a new day. Change is here. Change in this arena is now. We have to take control as best we can, not only for ourselves, this is not even about us, but for our children, for their children, for their children's children, and so forth. Madam Speaker, these are but some key and important features of this bill. A, it creates a legal framework for the conducting <clears throat> of carbon traded, trading credits, including carbon trading exchanges, carbon credit verification, and carbon trading registries. That's carbon credit verification bodies, it should be. B, the Securities Commission of the Bahamas, a government agency, must give approval for the listing of carbon trading products on carbon trading exchanges. There will be a registration requirement for persons wishing to conduct carbon trading businesses or operate as a carbon exchange, that's C. D. There will be mandatory requirements for registrants to maintain adequate financial resources and solvency. E, requirements for registrants to implement and maintain record keeping and data protection measures. F, requirements for registrants to comply with AML and CFT prevention measures and standards, and G, the establishment of offenses, penalties, and the sanctions for breaches of the bill. So gone will be the days that ships and vessels can dump fuels and chemicals into our beautiful waters and think they can get away with it. Gone are the days when companies can indiscriminately discard fuel, waste materials, without consequences. Gone are the days, Madam Speaker, when factories and businesses, only when they only concentrated on profits and versus the impact to our environment and our climate. They had no regards of it, but gone are those days. Madam Speaker, again, this is a new day when the environment must take priority, it must be protected, and there must be legal consequences for those who disregard and willfully damage it. Internationally, Madam Speaker, we are known for our sun, our beaches, our marine life, and other natural resources. We must now take the mantle to become pioneers of ocean-based and air-based carbon credits. We must take stock of our carbon sink assets, such as our seagrasses, and our mangroves and begin to manage our blue carbon credits on the local and the international market, which, <clears throat> which can eventually realize millions, if not billions of dollars for our country while we're protecting our environment. I attended the Oceans Conference recently and sat with some of the experts with seagrasses. And they're saying some 40 to 60% of all the seagrasses on this planet are in our ocean. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I wish to note that the carbon credit trading bill is a complementary piece of legislation to the Climate Change and Carbon Market Initiated Act 2021 and establishes the framework for regulating the activities in the carbon credits market 
and generally all trading activities in the carbon market. As we move to explore economically new streams through the enactment of novel legislations like this bill, we must ensure, Madam Speaker, that the economic benefit brought forth by bills like this, by this new market, this new emerging market, is passed on to the most common among us, the poor, those who are marginalized, those who feel economically imprisoned, that they too would benefit from this. Madam Speaker, we must also remember those who have made immense sacrifices to ensure that we are their voices here in this house, in this place. Far too often, Madam Speaker, they are forgotten. They continue to put us first. And in many instances, many cases, we put them last. Madam Speaker, I've always been a, cr a crusader when it comes to issues dealing with our natural resources and the Bahamian people. Historically, my position has always been and will continue to be that the natural resources of the country, belong of this country belongs to the Bahamian people. So consequently, the benefits to be derived from this new initiative must be felt by the greater number of Bahamians, from Grand Bahama to Inagua. They've got to feel this, Madam Speaker. Many of us recall, Madam Speaker, from day one in the parliament, I've been crying out about natural resources and its benefits. Well, Madam Speaker, it's beginning to materialize. A seagrass, a seabed, or mangroves, all are part of our natural resources. Say it again, Angus, then. Thank you very much. All of it, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, as I said, while I was sitting on the side opposite, as I said, yeah. while sitting as an independent, yeah. as I reiterated, yeah. Here where I stand, yeah. I've always been, Madam Speaker, consistent, consistent, Madam Speaker, on this issue, on this topic, on this matter, yeah. that socially and economically, that the Progressive Liberal Party has been that organization, yeah. socially and economically, yeah. to help to build a robust and thriving middle class. Yeah. And Madam Speaker, Dorian hit us hard. The pandemic hit us hard. And Madam Speaker, created a level of poverty and unemployment. But Madam Speaker, the same party that did it historically before, God has blessed us. God has blessed us and positioned us. Uh -huh. yeah. We did it before, Madam Speaker, yeah. and we are a well-poised machinery. Yeah. We are well-poised to do it again, Madam Speaker. Yeah. Yes. And I believe by God's grace, yeah. under the leadership of that man from Cat Island, yeah. with that oak, with that tremendously talented team he's surrounded by. Yeah. Yeah. We shall do this, Madam Speaker. Yeah. <laughs> Madam Speaker. <laughs> Madam Speaker. <laughs> as I always said, I came in this house as a free black man. Yeah. And whenever I give my last speech in this house, yeah. it'll be as a free black man. Yeah. As we now move to implement this carbon credit trading bill, we must take every effort to educate. We must educate our people yeah. as to what carbon credit trading entails. Yeah. We at the ministry, yeah. we will be hosting seminars, we'll be hosting town hall meetings throughout the length and breadth of this country to explain to all and sundry how we intend to utilize 
the adversities brought about by climate change to develop a billion dollar industry, creating, again, Madam Speaker, that robust, that strong, that thriving middle class. Yes, yes. Many have been left behind. Yes. And I want to encourage them, don't give up now. No, no. No. Don't give up now. Hold on a little while longer. Yes. Oh, help and hope is here. Yes. Madam Speaker, the passage of Hurricane Dorian, followed by two years plus of this COVID pandemic, yes. has led to record highs in unemployment and joblessness. But Madam Speaker, as a result, Madam Speaker, what is that, Madam Speaker? I shall not bite every bait that comes my way. And I shall exercise tremendous constraint and restraint. Madam Speaker, I heard the words of my friend from the other side. But I will stay focused. Stay focused. Stay focused. Madam Speaker, something has to be wrong with the clock. <laughs> Time, Madam Speaker, work with me, Madam Speaker. As a result of this visionary government, we've been sensitizing the more industrialized nations to what the natural resources of the Bahamas is. We want to do to mitigate the adverse effect of global climate change and the environmental crisis while at the same time creating new opportunities. While international carbon credits have been around since 1997 with the recognition of the Kyoto Protocols, new public attitude on climate change and carbon emissions have been emerging. We have driven companies to take a new look at dealing with carbon emissions. Here in the Bahamas, we have come to realize that our pristine waters, our natural mangroves, our wildlife breeding grounds collect nearly 60%, as I said earlier, of the world's carbon emissions. And we have not been collecting anything from the major carbon, carbon producers over the years. This government has voiced its commitment to positioning the Bahamas as a regional, if not global leader in the pursuit of net zero strategies and countering climate change. To that end, Madam Speaker, the Environmental Ministry were formulating plans with international climate action technology specialists to identify global warming reduction opportunities across the Caribbean and position our nation as a pan-Caribbean leader in tackling and addressing some of our greatest environmental challenges and opportunities today. These specialists are already providing environmental remediation solutions elsewhere in the Caribbean. And our vision contemplates a Bahamas where the carbon assets generated across the Caribbean can be purchased by the international community. Today is another historic day. The Bahamas and the Caribbean of tomorrow must be a place where we pursue aggressive reforestation, where we encourage responsible logging, reduce coastal vulnerabilities, enhance mangrove plantations, and reduce the economic dislocation arising from environmental problems. Madam Speaker, this then means new job opportunities for our people. Also, Madam Speaker, we must now put renewed efforts on both growing mangrove plants and ensuring the good health of the Bahamian grassy seabeds. This bill, Madam Speaker, seeks to widen and deepen the scope of our financial services sector by introducing a regulated environment for carbon credit trading which is a significantly growing financial activity in high global finance. Madam Speaker, at the same time as I close, by creating <clears throat> a conducive environment for the growth of this industry, the bill seeks to facilitate the long-term reduction in industrial gas emissions and thus control global warming and climate change, which pose a grave threat to the very existence of our islands. With the passage of this bill, 
The country kills two birds with one stone, so to speak. On two major fronts, Madam Speaker, it is important for all to note that in the establishment and operation of carbon credit trading in the Bahamas, there will be the strictest adherence to international standards. And so, it is expected that within the next few years, carbon credit trading will, de will expand exponentially and be fully integrated into a fi financial services sector, employing Bahamians across the spectrum and contributing to the overall growth and development of our nation. The government of the Bahamas, this New Day government, yes. ought to be commended yes. for this double-edged sword yes. of a good piece of legislation, yes. Madam Speaker. Yes. Madam Speaker, Golden Eyes supports this bill, and I encourage all Bahamas listening and watching, everyone that has a heart and a passion for our people to also support this bill. It's a good time to say as we continue going forward, upward, upward onward, onward yeah, yeah. together, may Almighty God continue to bless the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. And may I dare say, make the wealth common. God bless you. Thank you, Honorable Member. As many? Mm -hmm. Hmm. They're friends. <laughs> Chair recognizes the honorable member for Marco City. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, it is an honor once again to have this opportunity to speak by way of this house, by way of you to the Bahamian people, to express my ongoing gratitude to every voter in Marco City for your continued support and encouragement and guidance as I lend my voice to your voice to address those issues that affect you directly and indirectly. Madam Speaker, I also wish to acknowledge uh, that this weekend we had a wonderful celebration of independence. It was uh, wonderful to see the camaraderie of Bahamians as we joined with each other and for the most part disregarded our separate political colors. Because the reality is, Madam Speaker, that while some wear red during the political season, some wear yellow and other colors, the colors that ultimately matter in determining the forward movement of this country are the colors of the Bahamian flag. So Madam Speaker, I want to once again say it was a wonderful independence and I look forward to us continuing as Bahamians to be supportive of each other. Madam Speaker, today we are continuing the discussion about environmental stewardship and the potential benefit of good environmental stewardship for the Bahamian people and by extension the Bahamas. Madam Speaker, I've heard some say that this is the beginning of a new dispensation in this area that we are going to start to do some incredible things that will fight climate change and will ultimately protect the Bahamas from those forces that affect countries like ours that are nestled in the Hurricane Alley. Madam Speaker, this is not by any stretch of the imagination the beginning of environmental stewardship. We must be careful in our enthusiasm or pursuit of legacy building to become revisionists, rewriting what is a clearly documented history of very good environmental stewardship by Bahamians throughout the Commonwealth of the Bahamas 
and over successive governments. We have made tremendous progress, even though it is important to note that we have had some failures. Madam Speaker, I won't dwell on this issue far too many other important issues to comment on, but just for our edification. Madam Speaker, the Bahamas has long invested in marine area protection. Important milestones, Madam Speaker, include the creation of the Sea Gardens in 1892, northeast of Nassau, the establishment of the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park in 1958. Madam Speaker, I could go on. The point is, we have for well over 100 years been addressing this issue of environmental stewardship. I read just now, Madam Speaker, from the Bahamas Protected Marine Protection Plan, uh, which was a collaborative effort between a number of stakeholders by, by and large being led by the Nature Conservancy. It is a good read, Madam Speaker. One of the things we've been committed to over successive administrations is reserving marine protected areas throughout the Commonwealth of the Bahamas after consultation with stakeholders whose communities, whose livelihoods would be affected by the marine protected areas. The marine protected areas, Madam Speaker, range from no take zone, meaning unable to fish for any marine species to mix use marine protected areas where you may be able to uh, retrieve one particular species, could be the iconic grouper, but not uh, be able to get a lobster or cauk. Madam Speaker, this approach has been wonderful because studies clearly show that in some of those areas where one or uh, more species have been under threat, the years of protection has enabled that particular species to rebound. And so it's an important step forward. Incidentally, Madam Speaker, within these areas and adjacent to many of these areas are the following. Coral reefs, sea grass, wetlands, forests, all of these particular natural resources serve to function as carbon sinks, seagrass being but one of them. And Madam Speaker, for more than a decade, Bahamians have been busy valuing, placing a value, a process called valuation of natural resources. It is this process that uh, enables us to determine the value, for example, of the seabed, what's under the seabed, what's on top of the seabed, so that when vessels, and it could be any, it could be tankers, uh, it could be container vessels, or it could be, as it has been recently, cruise vessels that have anchored in the Bahamas and have damaged the, the seabed, or it is widely believed that some of these same category of vessels could have contributed to the recent coral diseases that we are now uh, facing. And in order to assess damages, in order to mitigate against damages done, there is a need to understand the value of what we have as a people so that we are able to appropriately charge those folks that have damaged our resources. We must celebrate our partnership with all of these. Uh, we are a transshipment point globally, and so our container companies, tankers that use our facilities in the Bahamas for storage of a variety of liquids, cruise ships that bring millions of people to our shore. We must continue to celebrate, nurture those relationships, but we must never do so at the expense of our patrimony and our future. And therefore, we need a quality of leadership that's unafraid to have candid conversations with uh, these companies in order to ensure that they pay their fair share when they make mistakes in our jurisdiction. 
And Madam Speaker, there have been lapses in judgment in this regard uh, that I know very well. And so, and so Madam, Madam Speaker, we have been valuing our natural resources over time. So it's important for colleagues in the government to be careful in the way in which we position what is, I believe, a shared commitment to support legislation such as what we're discussing today, the carbon credit trading bill, and as we supported previously, the climate change and carbon market initiatives. These are important steps in the right direction, Madam Speaker, but let us be clear, these are a continuation of decades, and we could say more than 100 years of effort by ordinary Bahamians, various stakeholders, as well as political organizations. To position the argument any differently is to be flat out dishonest or to demonstrate unawareness of what the history has been in protecting these shallow seas. And so, and so, Madam, and so Madam Speaker, we are happy to join in collaboration with the government in addressing an important issue. Because we know that valuation is one thing. It is important to monetize, in many instances, our natural resources. And even monetizing it is not a new proposition. We've been doing it before. But this certainly adds a dimension to what has been done, and it has potential to accrue benefits to the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. And so, Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister, I thought, spoke very clearly on one dimension in his presentation, which is to say that you're looking at a five to seven year period to see the kind of return that we hope for in this proposition. And that's, that's important to note, because depending on how one sells a proposition, we can create unrealistic expectation from a population that this thing overnight is going to produce the resources uh, required. We've heard that proposition before. That listen, man, your sovereign wealth fund, if you support, support me, you get access to the sovereign wealth fund, $100,000, uh, you know, in your pocket, and you Gucci. Sorry, that you're fine. And so, and so Madam, Madam Speaker, it's important that we share dreams but not sell unrealistic dreams or create unrealistic expectation so that people know that the business of nation building is hard work and requires ongoing effort and collaboration. And so, Madam Speaker, it's important to put that in context. It's also important, as I mentioned before, to put in context that when we see the Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas on an international stage addressing issues related to climate change that has a direct and indirect impact on the way in which the rest of the world treat or address uh, climate uh, issues, that we are happy and proud that additional voices, our voices, is being reflected out there. The only thing that causes us pause comes in multiple parts, but the only thing that gives us pause is when we seek to position every presentation as a grand slam when it is yet just another hit to make sure that every opportunity we have, we are adding our voice to multiple voices across the region, across the globe that are fighting every day to call on corporations, governments, citizens to be responsible in our stewardship of our planet. So, Madam Speaker, it is always better to undersell and over-deliver rather than the reverse. And unfortunately, in order for us to navigate some of the uh, sensitive political issues, we tend to oversell. We make every trip, even if it's, I don't know, just to watch a game. We make it about climate change. <laughs> it's not necessary. Unnecessary. Let us keep it uh, real. And so it was, it was indicated before, each former prime minister of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas have spoken at multiple international forums on these matters. And we applaud them all, including our prime minister today when he is out doing the people's business. Our only caution has been uh, you know, you accomplish the same thing sometimes with five members of the delegation rather than a dozen. 
given the challenges that we face in the country. So that's not, that's not, that's not a dig on the prime minister or the value of the work that he is doing. It is just about proportionality, given the fact that there are some folks through Key West Street, through Step Street, Fox Hill, through Epston Road, in Pioneer's Loop, in Carmichael, and Golden Isles, that have challenges. And when folks are on Facebook, selfieing themselves <laughs> and pushing it out on the media like that this me now nah, watch me that is problematic for the mother who is unable to buy food she is at the cash register just in front of me with a basket two kids in tow and trying to decide which items in that basket she is going to push on the belt that moves or on the silver portion where they must stay unless God touches one of our hearts to say, no, carry all, we got you. Yeah. And I know in this house on both sides, members do this routinely. Yeah, yeah, and that's why it's important. It isn't just about optics. It is about proportionality. Is it necessary? In other words, whenever prime ministers, whenever ministers, whenever heads of corporations travel, the litmus test we should have is this. Are there other heads of states at this meeting? Is this a function that a PM is at that a minister can go to? And even when the minister is minded to go, I thoroughly enjoy Portugal and Egypt as well. Uh, sorry, uh, Portugal and Italy as well. I haven't been to Egypt yet. I understand someone here has said they're going there shortly. But, um, but, but the, the, the point is, the litmus test is when the minister goes, is that something a diplomat already in Europe could have gone to? And then when, when, the, when the question on whether the diplomat uh, needs to go, is that a meeting that requires physical trial? And these are, all, these are all litmus tests you use that sends a signal to our people about where our priorities are. One of the difficulties I had while we were in government, and I said it, uh, I think I've sent most of you the articles when some mischievously questioned whether or not we ever had the slightest difference of opinion. But one of the difficulties I had then, I have certainly have now, is somehow we govern and not demonstrate to a population that is hurting uh, that we have a sense of urgency. And so it can't be business as usual. We can't be in crisis where we can't find sufficient money to pay those workers at Beaches and Park or in urban renewal. But we do have sufficient money uh, to go first class, and this isn't just the prime minister of the country. I don't want him to end up tired, maybe scrunch up in a chair. So I don't, but, but almost, you know, lots of other people. When there are some other folks who could have benefited from that additional two, 3,000, 4,000, I'm being generous, uh, those tickets, that additional cost on tickets. And so it is important for us to demonstrate to this public that we understand their plight. Some countries cancel celebrations or shifted the celebrations of some things in order to just send a message to the population, I hear you, I feel you. I use the example and some people have troubles with it, but forgive me. When you are at a house meet, a track and field meet, and you see a fella running his head, his back, and running all out, sweating, make up their face, coming dead last. But that crowd start clapping because they could see every effort being made to get to that finish line. What people do not see often with us is that we have this sense of urgency or sensitivity to what they face while it look like we flossing, like we, like we, live, in, like we live in large. And so, so, Madam Speaker, as we discuss the, as we discussed the, the climate change and carbon market bill, as we discussed today the carbon credit trading bill, I want us to be accurate about our history that multiple administrations and leaders have demonstrated a concern for where we are headed. Madam Speaker, one important part of this bill uh, that I certainly like is, is the fact that we will not only be able to trade carbon credits within the Bahamas, but 
Others from outside would be able to use uh, platforms that we put in place and we can trade on in other markets. But Madam Speaker, let me show you the contradiction of this. This is an important step. But we have to be real. There are Bahamians who wish to buy shares in publicly traded companies internationally. And we have archaic systems in the Bahamas that hinder Bahamians from legally. So, 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 Madam President, what we must do is we must overhaul and reform our financial services sector and the way in which we are doing business so that Bahamians can also participate in this international arena without having to duck and dodge if you're a cabinet minister today and have a bank account in the U.S. or you're a cabinet minister today and you're buying shares that you pray to God nobody can find out that you have the, the bank account in the U.S. And, you have, and you're buying shares in publicly traded companies. So, Madam Speaker, there are public traded companies who are benefiting from the resources that they have obtained in this jurisdiction to further strengthen their position and their shareholders. But those of us who live here, we are in a, such a partitioned system that we cannot benefit. And it's time that uh, enlightened or Afrocentrically speaking, in darkened thinking allows us to make those kinds of serious decisions, Madam Speaker. And so, Madam Speaker, just uh, again, back to the statement, person said, we are beginning. No, we're not beginning. Under the, under the free national movement, we passed the Biological Resources and Traditional Knowledge Protection and Sustainable Use Act. So that if persons come and benefit from genetic material they found in the Bahamas, that we would get benefits from that as well. Again, Madam Speaker, it is making sure that all of us benefit from the natural resources in the Bahamas. Madam Speaker, we conducted the studies. And while the member for Golden Isles was, was with us, uh, and though I know spiritually in many ways he still is, Madam Speaker, <laughs> while he was with us, we determined how many licenses we would be able to give out to the public um, and harvest aragonite in a sustainable way. It was a mistake not to launch that to the general public. You have an opportunity, a low-hanging fruit that you could launch now. We have a good sense of what the quantity of aragonite is and, and what amount of licenses we'd be able to issue so that in a sustainable way we can benefit from it. There are Bahamians who hold patents for a whole range of items that are produced from aragonite so that this opportunity to create value-added products from the aragonite exists. And we ought to increasingly add value onshore versus sending out raw material as if the only thing we have the capacity to do is to send out raw material for others to refine. That's precisely why I stand with the member uh, from Michael in terms of ensuring that the cast gorilla uh, plant, the bark, is used uh, to be processed in the Bahamas so we do not become preoccupied sending it out of the country uh, rather than processing it here locally. Again, a natural resource. A natural resource that can be used in the tourism industry to demonstrate, for example, Madam Speaker, from the planting of it to the refining of it, this is a part of our folklore, our storytelling, our history as a people, Madam Speaker. And so, Madam Speaker, multiple Ministers have traveled, whether it was to COP24, to COP25, whether it was to our Oceans Conference, or a wide range of conferences, including the United Nations, raising the issue of rising sea levels, uh, CO2 emissions, and the, the harmful impact on the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. And so, Madam Speaker, I want to pause. As politicians, we tend to take credit for things that we are on the tail end of, and we are mere signatories to. But to salute all all of the NGOs out there that have worked diligently on behalf of the Bahamas, who have worked on the marine protected areas, who've worked on ensuring that we protect our forests, who have made sure that we protect the genetic material that others have come in, taken away, made uh, inventions of, got patents for, and benefited from, and the Bahamas did not accrue any benefits. And so, Madam Speaker, I believe that we, this is a step in the right direction, but it is clearly a continuation of the work that has been done over multiple uh, decades where we are showing that we understand the value of what we have in our country and we are utilizing 
our natural resources for our benefit. And Madam Speaker, I, I wish to say that we have an opportunity now, as we talk about natural resources, to, to focus on the establishment of the uh, sovereign wealth fund at a level that we can properly use it. One of the things I did not hear in the presentation by the move, and I trust in, in the wrap-up, the Prime Minister would, uh, would address it. We were very concerned about uh, the fact that heads of, of agreement has already uh, been established, et cetera. And, uh, um, Prime Minister, you, you do intend to, ra to um, lay it today prior to leaving. We want to take a, a, a look at it. We, uh, again, uh, Madam Speaker, one of the, the, the concerns raised, uh, certainly in the community, is whether or not government intends to co-op all of the areas that you, you can have carbon sequestration. So we have the, the seagrass, wetlands, forest, coral reef. Some of this, these assets that will be involved in terms of a carbon sink are areas already protected under the marine protected areas. And so the question, the question is, I was saying that some of the areas that, that's being identified in terms of where seagrass is located are already in the marine protected areas. So, so it would be, it is important that we have a larger discussion around this issue. How does, how does that work in terms of, if it is an area that's presently being managed by the Bahamas National Trust, how does that work in terms of the benefits that flow out of that. Does that hinder a quasi-government agency, Mamas National Trust, or any of the NGOs that have been carrying out work in that, in that area? How does that work in terms of, of us doing what we've been doing all along? So one of the things, Madam Speaker, that when the Bahamas have written proposals internationally seeking support, whether it's, from, whether it's from the JEF, whether it's from the Global Environmental Fund, whether it's from the Green Fund, any of those international groups or foundations that contribute to, to the Bahamas, one of the things we have often um, argued with them is that the Bahamas is already providing an international service for the international community. Our waterways, our estuaries, for migratory species that move from north to south, south to north, um, or from east to west and vice versa. And so it is understood in the international community that we are playing a key role as a nursery for, uh, for many other countries. And, and so, Madam, Madam Speaker, the government is accruing unto itself without having clearly defined for us how the Bahamians are going to benefit. So I, I think it could be a function of time why that was not outlined in this presentation. But for, for the portion, for the portion of the 85% the of the revenue that's coming to the country, is that 85% going into a sovereign wealth fund or is that going into, the, into the, the consolidated fund? That's one of the things. Secondly, the management company that will be established, 49% of that, of that company is going to the Bahamian uh, people. Is that going to the Bahamian people through uh, their ability to buy shares, or is that going to the Bahamian people once again through the, uh, the aegis of the government, the Ministry with Responsibility for the Environment, and then those funds going into the Consolidated Fund? It is a more empowering exercise if shares was being given to Bahamians. What was the process in terms of making the selection of the companies that finally got the opportunity to trade uh, in, in terms of these uh, uh, carbon credits? And Will other marine protected areas, and we have, I think, about 43 of them, are they going to be included? Are our wetlands going to be next? Is the government going to co-op those and, and, and utilize it in that regard? So you have your wetlands, you have your forests, you have your coral reef, et cetera. There is a need for a larger discussion, so we are absolutely clear. Carbon sequestration, we support. Sovereign wealth fund, uh, being the, uh, the, the recipient of revenue we support. Bahamians having ownership in even the man in a management company is something we'd support. We had no opportunity to do a proper evaluation to determine if a 49%, 2% for NGOs. Again, we don't even know how that mechanism will work. Who are the NGOs? Is it, is it Nature Conservancy? Is it Brief? Is it Water, Waters Keeper uh, Alliances? Is it, is it Save the Base? Who all are included? All, all of the names. All, all, call all the names. So the question is, 
the, the question, there's no problem, but the question is, who will be in... No, no problem, but um, Bahamas National Trust is, go is, gov is government. So, so the question is, in those... Yeah, 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 yeah don't, 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 don't be distracted. I'm just saying we ought to be able to define who gets the 49 percent, who gets the 2 percent, and who gets the other 49 percent. It's a simple BTC formula, obviously, we're using. But we need a larger discussion, discussion to break down exactly how that mechanism uh, works, uh, Madam Speaker. And so while we, we support the bill, we, we encourage the government to have some additional discussions with members of the public, to educate the public on something that is potentially beneficial, beneficial for us. And so, Madam Speaker, as I, as I take my seat, let me also say, Madam Speaker, as we discuss natural, natu uh, natural resources, one of the challenges we have in the country is this issue of, of land reform. We talk a lot about the need to protect our patrimony for Bahamians. Yet, we have permitted thousands of acres in the Bahamas to be co-opted by Bahamians and non-Bahamians without a clear strategy on how to uh, address this issue. Madam Speaker, this is a pressing issue right now uh, that can be addressed. We heard yesterday that we're not doing enough to empower our people with land. And I believe there was a characterization made a few nights ago that, uh, that the repeal uh, of, of a Removable Properties Act is one of those things that contributed to uh, a change in, in, in price structure that disadvantaged behaviors. But we have a larger problem. The larger problem is we've not been swift enough to deal with the land reform issues in the Bahamas to truly empower Bahamians with land. Prime Ministers of the Bahamas, in my view, should no longer be almost a sole avatar to determine who gets crown land. And we should be able to move with a greater sense of urgency in making land available for economic opportunities. And when people are not fulfilling the obligation that they sign on to, that we are able to retrieve it. We should not permit persons to occupy land. Madam Speaker, I'll, I'll wrap up now um, with your permission. We should not permit people to occupy land. You evict them from one location, and then right under you, they are now building in another location, and we are too slow to move to address it. It is, Madam Speaker, um, it is a tragedy that these things uh, have happened, and they have happened under, under both administration. So we have an opportunity now to lay out clearly what that vision is in terms of broad land reform, and then more specifically in terms of regulated development, we have an obligation to our children and grandchildren yet unborn to take this in hand. And so, Madam Speaker, having said that, Marco City, the Free National Movement, we support the climate change and carbon market uh, initiative, uh, Madam Speaker. We also uh, support this bill before us, the carbon credit uh, uh, trading bill. And Madam Speaker, we are ready to collaborate with the government. Many members of the public are ready to collaborate with the government on this. We would have benefited, Madam Speaker, from a consultation with the, with, with the uh, government on this particular and other pieces of legislation that, that, um, that they are bringing forth so that we are able to give uh, feedback even in advance. And so with those few words, I wish to say thanks, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. Ms. Minnie? The chair recognizes the honorable member for Cat Island, Rumkins, and Salvador. Thank you very much, um, Madam Speaker. Uh, I feel, Madam Speaker, let me just thank all of those who participated in this bill. And I know it's very, you know, it's tempting um, uh, to stray very often. Um, in, in these in these debates uh, for the purposes of of I guess I guess scoring points uh, some people call it scoring cheap political points but let's strip away all the points that's being scored and accept the fact that and that's what I do I'm thankful to the opposition for recognizing that this innovative um, initiative finds support with them. 
it is new, it is evolving, and yes, we are optimistic that we'll be able to achieve that which we set out to achieve. But we also realize in our optimism that because this matter, this is a new initiative, right, we will have to continue to be vigilant to ensure that at the end of the day, the Bahamian Bahamians benefit most from our efforts. And we commit ourselves to that. So, in respect to the monetization of our carbon credits, and we're talking specifically about the seagrass in this instance. And I heard the member from St. Anne speak about what, what the Ethanum administration did. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> A little louder. Good. Um, banning the capture and destruction of of um, sharks and uh, there's another sea and animal. Single-use plastics. I didn't have that to do with this. No, that, that has nothing to do with this topic. I talk about the ocean. I, I about the ocean. And yes, and. and the banning of the harvesting of turtles. Each of those initiatives, each of those initiatives have served to, to preserve and to increase and make more robust our seagrass. Because the sharks is just balancing of nature, nature. If you leave the, the turtles, they eat the seagrass. Of course, the sharks eat the turtle to preserve the seagrass. And so, um, let me say, it's an initiative that we all supported. But the initiative came from the FNM. They were in power at the time. And they did those two initiatives for which the country will now benefit. And in fact, I think the uh, member from Golden Isles will attest that when they were speaking about seagrass, I think our country was commended for the preservation of sharks and turtles whilst at, whilst at the Oceans Conference. Um, now, insofar as where the fund's going to go, it's going to go for the benefit of the Bahamian people. Yeah. Firstly, it will either go into a sovereign wealth fund or a special purpose vehicle. That's where all of it will be held. And then from there, the disbursements will be made. And it will be transparent and accountable as always. And as I said initially in my um, introduction of the second reading, it is intended firstly to use those funds to ensure that we, that we adapt, we, we use it for adaptation and mitigation to ensure that we preserve our islands for future generation. And so infrastructure and any other initiative to protect us from the ravishes of the end game of climate change. That's where the initial investments will go. And thereafter, it will then deal with the other needs of our behaving people. And uh, I take this opportunity this time to lay the heads of a gun, which I said I would. <coughs> What did the document be brought up? And, um, and <coughs> Madam Speaker. What did uh, the document do lie on the table? There are still a lot of work to do 
to get where we it would wish to get because I highlighted one of the concerns that I have and we all should have. <coughs> and that is once we start trading in the and people and corporations, for example, begin to invest in a carbon market, they may then believe that they get off the hook from continuing the efforts to reduce their own carbon emissions by saying their carbon emissions is being set off by reason of their investment. And, and, and that will not, that will be counterproductive in our view. So as we work all these uh, kinks out, and we don't say we know it all, because this is still an evolving um, area, still very new. Now, you've heard about carbon, carbon credits, but the carbon credits that they have been talking about and that people have been investing in um, have been what they call the terrestrial um, um, credits, that's the trees and, and, the, and solar plants. Because you'll find that you know, one of our major shipping lines, for example, um, invested in a solar plant, $12 million. And they could, write, they could use that as a write-off against their carb carbon emissions. And the truth is that at COP27, and that's why we need to have all these uh, legislative pieces in place, because by COP27, we still have to um, further define some of the issues in, in um, uh, because it all stems from what they call Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, the voluntary market, and the um, and and the, for want of a better word, the you know, the mandatory market, right? And so you, and they still haven't worked out all the details. We now understand more clearly the voluntary market, and that's why we are entering into that because that is shaping up more quickly than the other market. And by by COP27, we may understand where they want to go with that. But suffice it to say that we are now dealing with the blue carbon, which is the seagrass. We spoke about the mangroves and the pond. Um, we, we understand that there are also carbon sinks, but we have, we have not reached there yet. And it may not be, it may be other entities that may wish to engage us in looking at that aspect for monetization. And then we'll, we'll move to engage them, if that be the case. Now, insofar as the consultative process is concerned, I think you could feel confident that that we have paid homage to the scientists, the group that made the discovery. Um, they, 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 they have spent and invested their own funds in the discovery, millions of dollars. So we'd have taken that into account when we decided how we would move ahead. Millions more is required for the continuing of the mapping and verification, which they are prepared to continue. And so it didn't seem appropriate to, to disrupt that exercise, which may have thrown us back another, just thrown us back. How far back, I don't know. But it was, it seemed more prudent for us to continue on the path that they were going. It's just that what they had wished to do, we were not prepared to do. And that is seed ownership. Yes. We kept ownership, we kept the bulk of the ownership of the assets, 
85% uh, of it. And we even went further. That in the management company, we thought that we should get some of that too. I, I, thought, I thought you kept 100% of the ownership of the asset for about 85% of the revenue from the asset. Yeah, yeah, well, 100, that's correct. Yeah, okay. That's correct. It's the management. Yeah, right. It's the management. But at the end of the day, it, it works out when you, when, you, when you monetize it. The monetization is ownership 100%, yes, payment. Mm -hmm. But monetization of that 100%, 85% mm -hmm. 85, 85 would be for us, plus an additional 49% of that management. Right now, so far as the NGOs are concerned, um, we uh, those the names that you call like like Kraft and the other we we'll be engaging them to discuss the way forward. And yes, the question about the marine protected areas have to be will be factored in. And there were some preliminary talks with Bahamas National Trust, and uh, we are going to to move with that. It's also a question, just like this, other issues. The, the member for, um, uh, what it says, for Charlotte, spoke about this concept of <coughs> additionality, which again hasn't quite been worked out amongst the parties of COP. And, so, and, and that will be, that will have some impact on how we treat the marine protected areas. So, so those are still things that we're working out and working on. But thank God we do have Bahamians, experts, yes. who have been working assiduously on this. They have been holding their own with the scientists and other, other persons involved in this. And yes, people, there's a great interest to get a hold of our asset. Mm -hmm. But we have now firmly, by legislation, vest that interest in the Bahamian people through our legislation. And the only thing they'll be able to do, we could manage it, and we'll pay for your expertise, but the bulk of whatever is monetized comes to us. And so, um, Madam Speaker, I want to thank each and every one of the the contributors to this debate for, for recognizing uh, where we're headed. And we will, we ask you to continue on this journey with us in this regard. Thank you, Honorable Member. The Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for West Brom. Madam Speaker, no further second readings, but I do ask now that the House resolve yeah. More than a question, I'll be put. <laughs> it has been moved and seconded that the following bill be read a second time and committed. A bill for an act to regulate the trading of carbon credits in or from within the Bahamas. As many are in favor will remain seated. Those opposed will stand. Order that the bill be read a second time and committed. A bill for an act to regulate the trading of carbon credits in or from within the Bahamas. Further second readings? No further second readings, Madam Speaker. I now move that the House resolves itself into the Committee of the Whole with the Deputy Chairman and the Chair. Thank you, Honorable Member. Is there a seconder? It has been moved and seconded that the, that the House do now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole with the Member, with the Deputy Speaker and the Chair. As many are in favor will remain seated. Those opposed will stand. The House will now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole with the, mem with the Deputy Speaker and the Chair. <clears throat> Mr. 
Chair, I now move that the long title of the Carbon Credit Trading Bill be agreed. Is there a second? Second. It has been moved and seconded that the long title of the bill be agreed. As many are in favor will remain seated. Those opposed will stand. The long title of the bill is agreed. Mr. Chair, I now move that part one of the bill be agreed. Seconded. It has been moved and seconded that part one of the bill be agreed. Yeah. As many are in favor will remain seated. Those opposed will stand. That's the amendment. Part one of the bill is agreed. Yeah, that's the amendment. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I now move that short title of the bill be agreed. Is this short title? We did that. Yeah. It's been moved and seconded that the short title of the bill be agreed. As many are in favor will remain seated. Those opposed will stand. The short title of the bill is agreed. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Chair, we now move the clause two of the bill be agreed. Stay with Beaker, Michael. <laughs> it has been moved and seconded that clause two of the bill be agreed as many. Oh. I move that <clears throat> that in the definition of the word derivative that that the words forward contract be deleted. So this is on the first line. So we'll now read an option, swap futures contract, delete forward contract. I got a second. That's close to. No, that's okay. the corporate's all. Is there a seconder? Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded that the bill be amended. Clause two be amended as read. As many are in favor will remain seated. Those opposed will stand. Clause two of the bill is agreed. So Deputy, I'm now move that clause three of the bill be agreed. Seconded. It has been moved and seconded that clause three of the bill be agreed. As many are in favor will remain seated. Those opposed will stand. Clause three of the bill is agreed. So, Chair, I now move that clause four of the bill be agreed. It has been moved and seconded that clause four of the bill be agreed. As many are in favor will remain seated. Those opposed will stand. Clause four of the bill is agreed. Let's now move that clause five of the bill be agreed. I can do that. I can go to part three now. It has been moved and seconded that clause five of the bill be agreed. As many are in favor will remain seated. Those opposed will stand. Clause five of the bill is agreed. Mr. Chair, I move that part. Clause 6 to 52 be agreed. But why you confuse me? It has been moved and seconded that clause 6 through 52 be agreed. As many are in favor will remain seated. Those opposed will stand. Clause 6 through 52 is agreed. Chair, I now move that the first schedule be agreed. Seconded. It has been moved and seconded that the first schedule of the bill be agreed. 
As many are in favor will remain seated. Those opposed will stand. The first schedule of the bill is agreed. Mr. Chair, I now move that the second schedule be agreed. The seconder? Second. It has been moved and seconded that sec schedule two of the bill be agreed. As many are in favor will remain seated. Those opposed will stand. Schedule two of the bill is agreed. Mr. Chair, I now move that the third schedule be agreed. Seconded. It has been moved and seconded that the third schedule of the bill be agreed. As many as are in favor will remain seated. Those opposed will stand. The third schedule of the bill is agreed. Mr. Chair, I now move that the bill in its entirety as edited be agreed. It has been moved and seconded that the bill it, in its entirety be agreed as amended. As many are in favor will remain seated. Those opposed will stand. The bill as amended is agreed. No, we're doing that today. <laughs> yeah, but we're doing it next week. Okay. Yes, yeah, till next week. Wednesday. I told you that. We're reviewing something. You put the question? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Chair. Now move that the House and the Speaker now turn to the chair. Is there a second now? Second. It has been moved and seconded that the Speaker do now take the chair. As many are in favor will remain seated. Those opposed will stand. The Speaker will now take the chair. What's that? Honorable members, the Deputy Speaker and Chairman of the Committee of the Whole has reported that the Committee has examined the bill, having made no amendments thereto. One having made amendments thereto. Made he made amendments? Okay. Having made amendments thereto. We go to third reading. Third reading and passing of bills. Honorable Speaker. I now move for the third reading and passing of the Carbon Credit Trading Bill 2022. Thank you, honorable members. It has been moved and seconded that the following bill be read a third time and passed. A bill for an act to regulate the trading of carbon credits in and from the in and from within the Bahamas. As many as many are in favor will remain seated, those opposed will stand. Order the bill be read a third time and pass. A bill for an act to regulate the trading of carbon credits in or from within the Bahamas. The motion is carried. Ordered that the bill do not pass, and the title thereof declared to be a bill for an act. Uh, 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 Let me see that. 
of the trade. Carbon Credit Trading Act 2022. For the third readings. No further third readings. Thank you, Honorable Member. Order that the clerk to take the bill passed by this House today to the Honorable Senate for their concurrence. We will now revert now to the order of business. Consideration of Senate's amendments, resolutions, member statements, appointment of select committees. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Sinan. Thank you very much. I, along with uh, no doubt the leader of the opposition and the prime minister, on behalf of myself, I declare my Self now to be a great fan of the Indiana Pacers. It's been advised that DeAndre DeAndre is joining Buddy Hill in uh, the Indiana Pacers team. So if there's more time left on it. Yeah. I'm still a, I'm still an Indiana Pacers fan. They may not be so bad. <laughs> Thank you, honorable member. <laughs> Further member statements? Appointment of select committees. Instructions to select committees. Discharge of select committees. Notices for future meetings. Can we on the pace or two? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Speaker, we should renew our notices in the name of the government. Thank you, Honorable Member. I wish to continue all business in the name of the opposition. Thank you, Honorable Member. Adjournment. Madam Speaker, I now move that the House adjourns to Wednesday, July 20th, 2022, at 10 a.m. Thank you, Honorable Member. Is there a seconder? Second. Thank you, Honorable Members. It, is a, it has been moved and seconded that the House that is rising do adjourn to Wednesday, 20th of July, 2022, at 10 a.m. As many are in favor will remain seated. Those opposed will stand. The motion is carried. Final adjournment? Madam Speaker, I now move that the House stands adjourned to Wednesday, July 20th, 2022, at 10 a.m. Thank you, Honorable Member. The House will stand adjourned to Wednesday, 20th of July, 2022, at 10 a.m. All right.